Will he win? Quick way. I believe it's Niska Viz win. Well, we Google because we're going to have a mock. No, I'm a rock, me cook. I got a jibbly to have a little bit of a mock card now. I got a jibbly to have a little bit of a mock card now. Um, and I'm going to apologize uh, in advance for my rooster who has decided um, that right now is the perfect time to start crowing right outside my window. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Geo Neptune. I am a two-spirit member of the Passamaquoddy tribe um, from Madakmigug or Indian Township. Um, and as Leah stated um, in her wonderful introduction, um, I am a, an artist of, of many mediums um, and I'm going to be um, focusing uh, primarily on basket making today. So I'll be talking a lot about the history um, of basket making, uh, but also uh, bringing a lot of focus to my uh, contemporary takes on some on, on basket making and how I in most recent years use my basket making as a way to share um, Aganud, Aganud Magno, um to share stories. So I hope uh, that you enjoy the talk today. Uh, we are going to have plenty of time afterwards for question and answers. Um, so I invite you um, to keep your mind open and to uh, consider uh, some of the things that I'm sharing today. Um, yeah, and without that, without too much more, we'll get started. So as an artist, a big part of my work, um, especially in more recent years, as I've decided to focus on my art uh, more exclusively, uh, my work has uh, really shifted towards telling this story, telling my story of trying to trace our footsteps backwards and trying to pick up some of the things that we've lost along the way as Wabanaki people. And one of those things that hasn't necessarily been lost, but rather been actively taken from us um, is two-spirit traditions. Um, and as a two-spirit person uh, who in a lot of ways uh, grew up without two-spirit elders to show me, um, you know, direct me in the right way um, to find these teachings, uh, it has been just a big part of my own development and a big part of who I am. So I won't be necessarily going into uh, any deep, um, really deep explanations on two spirits, uh, you know, two spirit ceremonial roles and two spirit practices. Um, you know, that's not the the point of my presentation, but I do want to be able to share two spirit knowledge with you all because it informs um, not only an understanding of my work, um, it is part of my duty to uh, to be able to share some of this medicine with other people. So the, the things that uh, I do share publicly um, are generally things that I know can either be found publicly otherwise um, or are things that I specifically have permission to share for my elders. So in order to talk about two spirits and this, this general understanding of where two spirits come from um, and, and what, uh, what two spirits are, especially if you've never heard this term before, um, Two-spirit is an umbrella term used to describe the many culturally specific gender and societal roles um, that are found across Turtle Island. And these culturally specific gender and societal roles are roles that exist outside of the contemporary cultural, culturally imposed gender binary. So all of that is to say that, uh, you know, two-spirit very specifically is linked to, that term is very specifically linked to cultures on Turtle Island and across North America. Uh, but what two-spirit means 
in each cultural context is going to change based on that nation um, and based on uh, you know that nation's location, their language, all, um, all of those things change in between. For Wabanaki people, a big part of our um, creation story has to do with what would, uh, for lack of a better term, be described as a tree of life. So in Wabanaki culture, um, that tree is specifically the brown ash tree. And the brown ash tree is what basket makers today use to make our materials out of. So when Galuska created Wabanaki people, he created us from the same people that we weave, uh, from the same people, from the same material that we weave our baskets with today. So when a Wabanaki person weaves with that material, we are mimicking the act of our own creation. We are each becoming miniature versions of, go is it, of the creator our, ourselves. So Galuska used his medaulan, used his, um, used his power, specifically fired his, his arrow um, at the ash tree and split it cleanly in half. And when he did so, he not only split the tree in half, but split the spirit of the tree in half as well. So that spirit, which was once whole, was now divided into two separate sentient beings, both of them coming from the ash tree. So Galuska spoke to these spirits and he said, you know, I have a gift for you. I will, I will transform you into Bamosuinuok. Uh, I will turn you into one who walks on the surface. I'll turn you into a person. But you must agree to steward this land. You must agree to take care of the dawn land, to take care of the air and the water and all of the creatures and people that will eventually live here as well. And you need to teach your children to do the same and to teach them to do the same. And so these spirits agreed. And when they agreed, Gluskab um, transformed them into Bamoswinog and the first Wabanaki woman and Wabanaki man emerged from the tree side by side and other people came out of the tree behind them other men other women and other children and at the very end of the line <clears throat> Gelwazid, um took the the very last two the last remaining essences of each of those of each of those spirits you know there was a little bit of a spirit left in the male side of the tree and a little bit of that spirit left in the female side of the tree and they were there was just enough left between the two of them to make one last person and so gal was it took those energies recombined them and made them whole again and the first two spirits stepped out from the ash tree and one of the reasons gal was it did this was because one gal was it themselves in a lot of ways in a lot of traditions is described as a two-spirit, as a being who is, you know, entirely genderless and this even mix of masculine and feminine energies. In our language, we refer to these two separate beings um, with their different names. We have Kachiniwesk, who is the divine feminine. And then we have Kachimindu, who is the divine masculine. And together, they are Galwasit, those, those masculine and energy, masculine and feminine energies combining are how all of creation came into existence. And so the two spirit being sent out from the ash tree at the very end of that line is representative of the two spirits role within Wabanaki culture uh, to be that person who was at the end of the line, to be that person who was able to look behind and see where Wabanaki people have come from and to remind Wabanaki people of our roots leading back to that tree and, and to back to our creation um, and to remember these stories and to remember these songs and these teachings and to make sure that they get passed down to not just you know the other men and women but specifically the children. Um, so in Wabanaki culture as in a lot of other cultures, um, two spirits were expected 
um, to not fulfill one gender role or the other, but be knowledgeable in both um, because they had double the responsibility to pass down. So again, we talked a bit about what two spirit is and what this uh, what this English term, you know, this uh, this term that was decided upon um, in a conference um, of the uh, uh, Native American uh, and American Indian Gays and Lesbians Conference in Manitoba, um, that two spirit was the best English term uh, that would describe this these alternative gender roles that existed um, in many different variations of each other and in very many and many different iterations of each other. So I created this uh, this Venn diagram to describe how two spirit, the identity is um, intersectional. And, and a lot of these roles um, aren't necessarily separ in, uh, separable from one another. Um, a lot of times, especially when doing research by um, white anthropologists, uh, two-spirit is defined as one thing as an, or another. It is defined as either sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and a lot of the other things um, that two-spirit encompasses are, uh, are kind of thrown to the wayside. So one, uh, one, information from Indian Health Services um, kind of identifies these four common traits that are common among two-spirit traditions. Um, the most common is that there were very specialized work roles for two-spirit people. Um, two, gender variation um, was a common intersectional um, aspect of two-spirit identity. Spiritual sanction, um, quite literally the recognition um, of the two spirit by the community from which they come from. Um, and then four um, was also same sex relations. Um, so those are four common traits found among two spirit traditions across Turtle Island. So that's where, uh, that's one of the things that helped me uh, make this graphic where two spirit is in the middle and in the other intersectional um, circles there, you have gender identity, you have the societal role um, that they fulfill, um, as in literally work duties and gender roles. Um, you have the spiritual identity and that two spirits per person's um, role within ceremonies. And then you have sexual orientation as the final aspect. A big part of the colonization process um, really rested upon the disempowerment of indigenous women when Europeans arrived who came from this Western patriarchal uh, societal view, you know, they were very disturbed uh, to find out that uh, women, not only were women um, serving in very um, empowered roles within our community and very respected members of our societies and often were the lead decision makers for our cultures, um, they were also equally disturbed um, at the existence of two-spirit people. Now, this is something, uh, the, the erasure of two-spirit people and uh, gender non-conforming people um, in cult non-white cultures worldwide has been one of the many, th many things throughout history um, used to justify white supremacy. Um, and in a lot of those, uh, even in many historical accounts, one of the things that they used to justify colonization, to justify violence against indigenous people, was the fact that uh, they felt there were not clear enough distinctions between men and women um, and their roles within society. Um, and so that made us less civilized. And one of the ways that they use, one of the things that they used to justify that there were no distinctions between men and women and their roles and expectations of them um, was the existence of two spirits. So not only did that help further white supremacy, it also specifically paid a major role in disempowering indigenous women um, on the East Coast by removing two spirits, by removing people who had that societal role of being a mediator, of being the people who would step in between the men and women and help resolve these conflicts 
um, it makes it easier to force men and women to turn on each other, um, to disempower those women, um, to convince the men uh, to participate in that disempowerment um, and thereby uh, have them contribute to their own disempowerment and to their own colonization. So erasure of two, uh, so the disempowerment of, that, of indigenous women was um, a key part of ensuring that colonization would be um, you know, relatively successful um, and that conversion to Western beliefs um, would be more successful. That was one of the key steps. And in order to disempower indigenous women, they needed to remove the people in between. So I mentioned earlier about uh, not having very many two-spirit elders uh, to look up to growing up. I do wish to acknowledge, you know, my two-spirit elders, um, Deanna Francis and Dr. Deanna Francis and uh, Alice Clare, um, who have been, who were very influential um, in my life growing up and a big part of why I needed to um, keep working to find these traditions and keep bringing them back and make sure that future Two-Spirit youth don't have to work as hard to find these teachings. Um, I once went to one of my elders um, and I asked her um, for Two-Spirit teachings and if there was anything she knew. And the only thing she said to me, um, you know, is that quote at the top of the page right now is that I heard stories about them, Two-Spirits, when I was a little girl and we don't have those anymore. So even from one of the spiritual leaders in my tribe, two spirits were just a memory of the past. Um, and I, when I first came out, um, you know, as many queer people might identify, I've had many coming out experiences over my life. But when I first came out the very first time um, to my grandmother and to my family when I was a teenager, um, you know, my grandmother had said, I know the elders said he would be special and would help our people, but I didn't think that they meant that he was too spirited. And so that was one of the first times I'd heard the term, um, and hearing the, the, the term too spirited doesn't, um, didn't give me necessarily the impression that it was something that I wanted to be called. So this experience of being my own elder and having to find elders um, that had these two spirit traditions um, and, and could share them um, has been a long, long journey. And it's involved um, being able to recognize when I get messages from ancestors and from the creator, um, and one of these messages was given to me um, in ceremony, just as I, just after I'd come out as non-binary, just after I'd come out, you know, in my own community as saying like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be living my life um, as a two spirit now and, and doing my best to, to find, you know, keep finding more traditions in addition to what I found already um, and keep sharing this information with my people. I mean, I'm going to do it at home. Um, so one of the messages that I got from an elder um, in the first ceremony that I decided to wear a traditional skirt to, uh, you know, the elder said um, that one of the messages from the ancestors was um, that the way I was dressed in that ceremony, wearing my traditional skirt, um, was how Creator wanted me to dress all the time. Um, and that that was you know, going to be part of my path and part of the medicine that I'm to carry going forward. Um, I was also uh, given the message in another ceremony, I'm in the Medewin Lodge, um, and I, I still am interpreting this one. I don't know what it means, um, but the message was that I'm supposed to walk with the rainbow and not behind it. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm supposed to walk with it and integrate it and use it as a way to pull people in um, and not project that bright, shiny, colorful um, light out in front of me um, as a way to keep people away um, because it has the ability to do both. And so a big part of what I am 
I try to do as a person and a big part of what I try to do as an artist is living for that next generation of two spirits. Um, and part of that was, you know, making sure that there are now um, two places for two spirits specifically um, within our ceremonies. Um, a big part of that has been receiving my traditional name, um, which is Niska Bizuin. Um, and Bizuin comes from two words. There's, there's the ending uin, which means kind of a being or even a person. But in this case, it's, it's specifically not a person. Um, but bizun is the other part of that word. So bizuin, and bizun means medicine. So bizuin means medicine being or medicine spirit or a very powerful spirit. Um, it's, it's a very specific word um, for a very powerful spirit that you might encounter. Um, and then nizgab um, means uh, two of them standing as one. Uh, so the elder that you know received my name said that the closest in English um, to make it make sense because a lot of things aren't directly translatable um, would be that you know a two spirit person, two spirit being stands with medicine power. Um, so that is um, you know a big part of my part of my journey was receiving that name and receiving that acknowledgement um, from members of the spiritual community um, and, and my family and my surrounding community. Um, and I choose, I like to use this background, this particular sunset, um, because the spirit colors that I received, you know, just after my name in ceremony are um, purple, red, orange, and white. So I use these colors in a lot of the things that I do. Um, I like to talk about a lot of these things, and I need to make sure that there are very real issues that are brought up when I do. Um, and one of the things that I make sure to acknowledge is that suicide is the second leading cause of death um, in Indigenous youth between uh, ages, uh, ages 5 to 24. And LGBTQ youth are five times as likely to attempt suicide um, than heterosexual youth. And one of the ways that I always advocate for um, people to work towards changing these things um, are to, you know, use um, trans and gender variant people's names, um, even if you happen to know their birth name, or you might hear it referred to as their dead name, um, you know, using their, their name um, that they identify as, um, that they've chosen for themselves is one way um, to, you know, just affirm and strengthen that, um, that person's mental health. Um, to use the correct pronouns um, to not, and not refer to them as preferred pronouns or chosen pronouns, they are just someone's pronouns. Um, you can also correct others when they dead name and misgender trans people. Um, you can normalize the use of pronouns within your own organizations um, and circles, um, and including gender variance in your company's policies and mission, mission statements. Uh, you can vote in favor of LGBTQ plus and indigenous people. Teach others about these issues, especially because there is a common phenomenon described among people of color um, that often times um, white people don't listen until other white people say it. Uh, so it's important to, uh, to help draw attention to these issues. Um, and it's also important to believe trans people, to believe LGBTQ plus people um, and indigenous people when we talk about our stories and we talk about our, um, our adverse experiences. These are some books that I have uh, that were really big on my, just my start of my journey uh, for finding Two-Spirit resources and, and trying to find more documentation of, of Two-Spirit people in the East Coast and in, on the East Coast and specifically in Wabanaki culture. Um, so I did wanna just throw these books up for anybody who wanted to look into some further reading. Uh, but I'd like to spend more time focusing on this book in particular. Um, this is um, 
Mi'kmaq Boinok, uh, Two Spirit Medicine, um, Sexuality and Gender Variance, Spirituality and Culture, uh, by Dr. Joseph Randolph, Randolph Bowers and Elder Daniel L. N. Paul, um, Elder Dr. Daniel Paul. Um, I'm still in the process of reading this book, and I uh, am really, really enjoying it and really thankful for it because it's answering a lot of these questions that, you know, I've had since I was a youth, trying to find these resources, trying to find this, um, this information, um, and just trying to find what my path is and how I'm supposed to keep going and creating these spaces for other Two-Spirit people to, to step into. Um, and I know that in a lot of Two-Spirit circles, um, the word Boenach is, um, or Boenach is um, being, I guess, kind of promoted as the word for Two-Spirit people. And while Two-Spirit and Boenach are definitely intersectional, um, I do not see them as interchangeable. Um, and one of the unfortunate things that I'm seeing is that uh, some people are starting to describe that two spirits, uh, or that, that cisgendered and heterosexual people were two spirits as well. And that this idea of promoting um, homosexuality and trans people um, or making equality for trans people is coming from Western um, ideals and Western mindsets. So it's almost happening in reverse that they're trying to once again remove queer people from our own histories. Um, and so those things are definitely intersectional. And I know that many teachings state that all Buawanach or Madawlanog in Passamaquoddy um, are expected to learn lessons from two spirits and learn how to tap into that energy of balance. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that two spirit um, and the word Madawlanog or Buawanog um, are easily interchangeable. Intersectional, yes, lots of uh, overlap, um, but they do not mean the same thing. And I think that um, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Paul, um, you know, do a really good job of explaining that and talking about two-spirit medicine and, and where it comes from in Wabanaki culture. Um, and I don't, I know we're getting fairly close to having to switch to Q&A, so I need to get to actually the part where I talk about my art. Um, but one thing that I, that I take away from this book um, is that in many other societies, I, I've heard as many of um, five to six separate and distinct I won't say gender roles, but gender medicines um, in other native cultures. But in Wabanaki culture, um, there are seven gender medicines. And they talk about this in this book. And uh, very briefly, those seven gender medicines um, in Wabanaki culture, uh, women are the first medicine. Men are the second medicine. Now I'm gonna, this is where I'm gonna get muddled up on the order a little bit, but um, women loving women, or wi uh, women nurturing and become masculine is the third medicine. Men nurturing and becoming feminine is the fourth medicine. Women loving women is the fifth. Men loving men is the sixth and the seventh medicine is two-spirit medicine. So those are seven separate, I mean, well, not necessarily separate because they are intersectional. So seven intersectional yet distinct gender medicines within our society. So, this all kind of brings me forward to kind of being two spirit in, you know, in the 21st century and what that means um, in this modern context, what this means, you know, in the era of technology, in the era of YouTube and TikTok and, uh, you know, in this 
overall changing cultural shift where indigenous people aren't forced to be underground anymore. We aren't forced to keep our ceremonies secret. We aren't forced to keep our languages secret or our teachings secret. Um, you know, now there's this, um, again, this, this phenomenon of us following our footsteps back and, and picking up these things that we've lost. Um, so I think a lot about, you know, not only the things that we've lost, um, all of the catching up to do uh, that we have to do, like where we would be in this century had we not lost those things um, and how we have to keep not just thinking backwards to reclaim, but keep thinking about how we're going to move forward and how we're going to bring those things forward with us and how they'll continue to shape and change. This is my grandmother. Um, I began weaving with her uh, when I was four years old. And we spent a lot of time together weaving. Um, she came from a very long line of basket makers. Um, she married and, and had children, you know, my mother and all of her siblings, um, with someone else who came from a long line of basket makers. Um, so basket making um, has always been a huge part of, of uh, you know, the way my family connects to each other and part of our family traditions. Um, so this photo was taken, I believe, my freshman year of college. Um, yeah, and she definitely was always um, a bit skeptical of some of the big crazy ideas of baskets um, that I would uh, that I would come up with. You know, she's she still came from that old school mindset that yes, baskets are pieces of art, but ultimately they're meant to be used. So when I made more pieces of art that were just you know kind of specifically designed um, to sit on a shelf and not be touched very much. Um, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to her. Um, and and I just, I remember she would always be very, um, very skeptical of some of the new ideas I had, um, especially if I tried to describe them to her ahead of time. I would often have to wait until everything was finished to show her anything, um, or she would, you know, be very skeptical, or even worse, um, take something of mine apart when I wasn't looking. Um, because she thought I was making a mistake when I was trying to make a new pattern um, and she couldn't see it in her head. So that was a common, <laughs> a common occurrence for us. So when I was four years old, um, I was begging her to make baskets um, and she kept telling me, no, I had to wait until I was older. So when I was finally old enough to go to the, um, the reservation summer camp, uh, just as I was, just before I turned five years old, um, I was able to talk my way into a basket class um, that was only for middle school students. So I was going into kindergarten. It was supposed to be for like sixth grade. And I talked my way right into that class and they con convinced them to let me in. Um, and so when I came home that day, uh, my grandmother said I didn't react the way I normally did when I got off the bus and like be very excited to come in. I just got off the bus. I walked into the living room. and. I set my first basket down on the table in front of her and just looked at her. And then I went outside to play with my cousins. And that's that basket that you see on the left there, that little one that's got a nice little lean to it. Um, it definitely looks like, you know, it was made by a, a, a four-year-old Geo. Uh, and then later that fall, uh, my grandmother, you know, eventually caved and realized that I was right and I was ready to make baskets um, no matter what she thought because I had proven it to her. Um, so we made that little red basket together um, just after my fifth birthday that summer. Um, and I remember thinking when it was done, it just wasn't quite geo enough. Um, it, it needed something more. Um, so I waited for her to 
uh, you know, is to go to the restroom or something, uh, something that I knew I would have time to kind of hide in the corner. And I grabbed my crayons and I started coloring that little um, plain ash handle. Um, and I remember being very upset that they were rose art crayons and I was very specifically a Crayola crayon user um, at five years old, uh, which says a lot about the future of my art career. Um, but to Rose Art's, you know, to Rose Art's credit, those crayons are still clearly visible on that ash handle. They have not gone anywhere. They have barely faded. Um, so maybe I've been, you know, unjustifiably sleeping on Rose Art crayons. Um, on the left, you have one of my grandmother's signature baskets. Um, it is a strawberry basket that is common among many ash weaving cultures um, and has roots and ties to um, women's ceremonies. And most specifically, um, I've heard that uh, one lost use of a strawberry basket for our people is that they used to hold baby's umbilical cord. Um, so to have that, you know, that connection to the strawberry basket um, and to my grandmother um, has that really strong women, women's medicine within my family for me. So that's her version on the right there, or on the left there, and then that's my version on the right. I've always made smaller, um, smaller baskets that were partially dyed green. Um, because, you know, my grandmother promised this mold that belonged to her great grandmother um, and goes back in her family many generations, um, that was promised to me that I would receive that strawberry mold to make that strawberry on. So I kind of, I guess, made this, this promise that I wouldn't make an all red strawberry um, until my grandmother handed me the mold and said, um, it's your turn now. And unfortunately, that's not the way it happened, even though we both planned it that way. Uh, these are some baskets that um, I made. Uh, just as I started, I made this decision to make baskets full time. Um, so there are different variations on Wabanaki's shapes and colors. Um, and uh, really kind of significant, um, signifying of when I started to really develop my own style um, as a basket maker. Uh, my version of an old style sewing kit, complete with a scissor fob, um, a little pin cushion, um, and eventually I made a little thimble basket to contain the thimble as well. Uh, more versions of my grandmother's berries. Um, when I start to dye them crazy colors, we've got a blackberry there and then a blue raspberry. Um, I've done oranges, I've done pinks, and I call them extraordinary. Um, I also, uh, the fruit mimicking baskets are a big part of Wabanaki culture um, and history. So um, I kind of did my own version of a corn basket, which is an old traditional form. Um, but I did this rainbow corn, um, and I, and the Passamaquoddy word for corn is biaskaman, and I called this biaskaman, um, or gaze in English. Um, this was a basket that I, um, without telling the whole story that I created, uh, to tell the story of how, uh, in Wabanaki creation stories of how night shifts today um, and why, you know, the sun moves around the earth instead of it all being daylight at once um, and then everybody having nighttime at once. Uh, this is a piece that is currently at the uh, Idle Jorg Museum um, in their permanent collections. And I made this piece as a commemoration um, of the Pulse Orlando massacre, I believe 2016. This is a combination of baskets and beadwork that I worked on and, and doll work that I've started experimenting on. Um, and this was meant to be a bit of a self-portrait. Um, she's wearing women's regalia, um, but the double peaked cap is something that has typically been worn um, by men in Wabanaki culture and in Wabanaki um, historic documentation. 
uh, but is uh, has been known to be worn specifically in the Passamaquoddy community by shamans. Um, and I have seen uh, two spirit women um, wear this as part of their regalia. Uh, so that's why I chose that shape as opposed to her traditional um, single peaked cap. These are some examples um, of my drag from photo shoots that I've done. Uh, and, you know, I think a drag was a big part of um, embracing uh, myself um, and embracing my, my two-spirit identity and just starting to explore that. Um, and this is kind of more of a contemporary uh, photo of what my drag looks like now. Um, I wear try to wear very exclusively native designed and na uh, native designed clothing and native made jewelry. Um, and you know, I, I, that's what I wear. Um, I try to make sure that it's more than just possible. It's, it's what I do as part of my drag. Um, and I've also started, uh, making music on, um, Spotify. I just released my first single, um, this fall. Um, it's, I think it's really important to note, um, just before we open for a uh, discussion and questions, that uh, Wabanaki basketry has for a very long time been that symbol of resistance. Um, you know, when we were forced onto reservations um, and, and forced into this cash-based economy, uh, you know, it was dictated that we were going to learn trades. We were going to learn how to be quote unquote civilized people and participate in this society. And while some families may have agreed to do that and gone to learn trades um, and, be, and and do these different roles um, within outside societies, um, many Wabanaki people um, and many Passamaquoddy people uh, refused to do so. And they chose to continue practicing um, Wabanaki cultural traditions at their own risk um, as a way to survive in this uh, cash-based economy. So our basket making shifted from utilitarian tools to ceremonial objects um, to tr from trade objects um, to being a little bit more focused on that trade aspect, specifically trading um, with tourists and uh, using them as, um, you know, as, uh, as a financial resource, as a way to provide for your families. Um, and so that's a big, a big history in not only my family, but many other Wabanaki families as well. 